Hey, Sebastian, you know, thanks so much for uh, joining us uh, in the car ride. Uh, you know, uh, you've already been in the car a bit yourself. Uh, but exactly. uh, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> but we'll do our little tour and it'll be, it'll be fun. You can, uh, you know, do the uh, ride along. Um, but do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm Sebastian. I lead the Kubernetes Competence Center. We uh, renamed it actually to Container Competence Center and Platforms. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also uh, today in the CTO Summit um, with the other end user enterprises. And um, I do uh, transformation evangelism, you could say. So I have uh, many, many ideas and publications and I do like 20 to 25 keynotes a year about uh, enterprise transformation oh, gotcha. and on basically on people first processes and on how to create a lasting transformational force rather than uh, doing some uh, adjustments in your uh, mailbox signs. <laughs> as enterprises <laughs> Rather than just do, like, right? yeah, just uh, <laughs> here, here's the note that tells you how you need to change your life. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you haven't found that to be effective? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we, we've been pretty effective actually. Um, We've created the Competence Center four years ago. Uh -huh. uh, we started out just three of us, uh, two engineers and me. Mm -hmm. um, they already built a proprietary Kubernetes control plane okay. for two years uh -huh. at Audi. And you remember the 2019 market, it was like a super control plane heavy, 20 yeah. startups doing their own control planes, yeah, yeah, yeah. managing Kubernetes itself. So, um, or, or doing an abstraction layer um, above uh, cloud provider Kubernetes yep. and stuff. Anyway, this uh, you've seen it back then. Uh, the focus is completely different now. Control planes are a commodity. Allocating compute is commodity. It's not a business case anymore. It's a value add. Right, uh, right. It's just a like, feature. Like it was like yeah. 2019 or before. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, and we, we started out like this, creating our own platform and enabling uh, project teams to securely deploy their workloads to and run them on a Kubernetes. Let me ask you a background question, though. Like, yeah. like, why? Like, what, what, what was the driver to create this team in the first place? Like, what was the, you know, what was the goal? Did somebody just wake up one day and be like, we need to modernize somehow? Or, or was there, like, some business goal? Or, like, what was the driver that started that transformational event? Um, the, the transformation definitely is a completely different thing um, decoupled from the team itself and its technical um, capabilities that mm -hmm. we created there. It's, um, I have a, like a 10 year background in startups, mm -hmm. um, being in startups in, uh, in the Munich area uh, for 10 years. And uh, for example, before Audi, we created an IP TV solution that mm -hmm. is market leader now. And I was responsible for the apps from the first customer to 1.25 million customers. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that's a few. Yeah. 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 And, and then uh, when uh, going to, to Audi, we wanted to bring some startup culture into the enterprise. Okay. And obviously, we had to wait until we were uh, able to um, deliver and prove um, that our methodologies, that our ways of working, that our culture um, is paying off mm -hmm. and that it can survive in an enterprise surrounding, in an enterprise environment. Right. And like I said, it's decoupled from the technical capabilities and, and what we're focusing on. Because uh, the team was focusing on the Kubernetes control plane to assist one project team. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. That's basically how it started. Uh -huh. And taking it from one project team to many project teams with an inner source um, way of uh, handling the things, um, that paid off and we're uh, 14 people now. Mm -hmm. And we're a competence center. We are uh, consulting other platforms in their uh, how they want to build things, how they want to create things, what uh, focus they're on, if they're an infrastructure platform or rather an abstraction layer above it, a business integration layer with uh, serving a couple of managed services to a um, homogeneous group of workloads, for example. 
Okay. And does, so does your team uh, provide software or does it provide more like guidance and architecture and design, all of those things? Uh, like, so, you know, how do you, you know, kind of, what is the competency center kind of, you know, what does it give to the, the your customers in a sense? Yeah, the first and foremost thing of them all is a platform to deploy workloads. Okay. To. So there's a focus on two things. It's secure runtime. Mm -hmm. These, that sums it up perfectly. Um, it's just security and runtime uh, we focus on. And you have these, let's say, um, normal workloads um, that don't have too many special requests. Mm -hmm. And they can all deploy very easily to that platform and uh, run their workloads to uh, CI CD there. And it just makes sense for, for uh, the biggest uh, amount of applications in the organization. And uh, then you have some applications, obviously, that have a very special use case, like a machine learning, AI use case, of um, a tremendous amount of workload peaks. Mm -hmm. And you want a different uh, consumption model um, in uh, scalability, obviously. And uh, maybe they need a couple of managed services. And right. then we create something like a business integration layer, business domain services. And we consult these people that want to own uh, the business integration layer on how to do that mm -hmm. and how to consume the infrastructure layer. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So let me, and I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure if you can entirely get into this, but so when you are talking about these, uh, you know, kind of software teams and development teams, are they mostly like the stuff that kind of runs Audi or is it the stuff that actually like runs in the cars or both or, you know, or is yeah. there, how's that, how's that division done? Is it different kinds of engineering, you know? Yeah, it's completely different from each other. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't run things in the car. That mm -hmm. would be um, completely differently regulated as okay. well, because it's regulated like bringing hardware to the streets. Right. Yeah. Okay. So IoT or any steering software is um, basically, from a legal point of view, if you do a software update on on a IoT device in your car, right? It needs to run through the same processes as as, as if you've built the entire piece from from scratch. Right. Yeah. I, so, I, yeah. I'm I'm not unhappy about that, to be honest. <laughs> as, a, exactly, as a driver exactly. of a car, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? So yeah. they can't um, patch your car uh, dangerously. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Um, yeah, um, I've seen I've seen a lot of software people have written safety so. processes in this case. <laughs> yeah. It just makes sense. Um, you don't want this in, in transportation, in car, trains, airplanes. Mm -hmm. It really makes sense. Right. So, uh, so mostly what you're working with is the uh, kind of all the software that runs Audi yeah. itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have Audi IT has six thousand six hundred applications. Mm -hmm. It's quite a number. Yeah, that is. A few, and yeah. uh, obviously, <clears throat> there is um, on-prem, there is public cloud, there mm -hmm. is all the flavors that you can think of. Right. Uh, and all the needs, all the requirements. Um, that you can think of in any organization. We have them, we find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't make our job easier, to be honest. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. It is, as we were, you were saying, kind of the beginning about transformation. It is it is nice in theory to be able to send out that email that says, you will all be on Kubernetes on AWS. And yeah. it just uh, never works. Enablement is everything. Right. You need right. to, you need to um, be sexy enough that the people want to work with you. Mm -hmm and are never forced to work with you. Right, right. So if you have a like a tractional force mm -hmm. that really attracts the people to work with you because they know if if you work with these guys, with Sebastian and the team, um, and they force you kind of to have success. Right, right. We, yeah. we don't let loose uh, of the hand of our project teams until they have success, until right. they're running productively in the cluster. Uh -huh. Or we consult them very, very early on where to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, um, or where they can get the help to be successful. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Because we know all the platforms in the VW Group, and sometimes we just say, well, this is a classic on-prem case. Maybe you just uh, move on to our colleague over there. His yeah. name is this and that. And, uh, or RVS, for example, mainframe stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're not um, like uh, super keen on uh, lifting and shifting monoliths. Mm -hmm. And we're, it's not, Kubernetes is not always the answer, mm -hmm. nor is um, uh, public cloud always the, the, the right answer. So 
Um, we are very, very early in the in the consulting process for a project, mm -hmm. and then we can advise them on pursuing the right path, on being successful in their actually in the world yet they want to create because the compute for them usually is like. Um, they're not very motivated in this topic because it's just uh, annoying for them. They want to create business value in their oh, application, yeah, yeah, yeah. but not really bother about the infrastructure. You right, know? It's, right. Often it happens that they create something yep. and they're like super proud of it, and yeah. then they they're like, okay, where to run it? Right, right. Um, oh. Yeah, no, I totally understand. <laughs> so, so um, you know, you said there's what, six thousand something plus projects, right? Yeah. Um, so, how do you how do you do that transformation? Like, how do you scale your team of what did you say, less than fifteen, something like that? Like to get to support that yeah. many uh, different teams? It, yeah, actually, with me, it's fifteen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, the the way to do it is like not investing too much energy in fighting the silo as they put it mm -hmm. it's a it's a uh, mind-boggling and useless fight you can invest 80 percent of your energy uh, your political energy but also um, your uh, an entire uh, day of work mm -hmm. into talking to people and um, fighting the silo so to say it's uh, it makes more sense to respect the silo because it's the way to uh, organize big uh, organizations like enterprises. We have 87,000 people at Audi, 440,000 people at BW Group. Mm -hmm. So it just makes real sense to um, not uh, invest too much energy into that rather than asking why you would even fight the silo. What's the business value you want to take out of this? And you can define that quite easily if you ask a couple of times why you're doing that anyway. Why is DevOps a thing? Why mm -hmm. is DevSecOps a thing? This end-to-end -end responsibility uh, obviously makes sense um, uh, in a wider sense and you can create that through the silos. For example, transformation usually happens that people define a process, mm -hmm. they uh, get the tech for it, uh, they decide upon the tools and then they tell the people what to do or they define roles yep. that fill out uh, this organizational structure mm -hmm. and then they hire for the roles. And that is so not people-centric and what happens then is that the people satisfy the process rather than solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Because they don't even know what the problem was in the first right, place. Right. They're so far away from what the people who made the process had intended uh, actually, or whatever, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. and they, and they want to get shit done. Actually, right. they are right. really like maybe passionate about um, and their field of work in there. So what we do is uh, we look at the people first, and um, I ask my team always, um, "What are you passionate about?" We have this stuff on the plate. Mm -hmm. Pick one. Mm -hmm. Be good at it. Right. So be, I know if you're passionate about it, you will be just nailing it. You will be really good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, if you if you have the motivation to deep dive into that, so we um, put people first, mm -hmm. and then um, let them choose the best tech to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. um, usually, bleeding edge uh, is the thing in our competence center. Okay, and and then automate it, right? Because we're not too many people, right? Right. We right. need to mm -hmm. automate stuff to make it work and scalable. Mm -hmm. But what happened if you automated the tech? through passionate people is you you receive a process oh, it's a yeah, natural yeah. Yep. process that evolved through the automation of what you did before yeah and uh, then you can uh, processualize the process and uh, make it a thing in your organization like a rule right right so to say a rule to follow but you haven't created it by um, thinking about how it could work, mm -hmm. you have created it by actually solving a problem. Right, right. In that yeah, moment. You're kind of, I mean, it's, you it's solve kind the of the bottom first. up versus top yes. down kind of thing. You, you could say you so, know. you could say so. Um, you yeah. solve the problem first and then you scale the solution. Right, right. Not, it's actually, not the other way around. You know, at a much smaller scale, uh, you know, it's kind of yeah. what we're doing, like even within our, like this Spark program that we do all these software projects yeah. for third parties, is we, you know, we want all the teams to use GitHub. Okay, so the first thing we do is we start establishing repos for the students and when they're doing the student teams or whatever. And then the next thing we do is, okay, now let's build a little tool that we can now modify the contributors file yeah. and it will put the right people on it, right? And so, so the process kind of, 
you know, creates itself while we automate it, which exactly. I, I very much exactly. agree with. Yeah. It's, it's adaption. Adaption is the magic thing yeah. here. Yeah. So um, it's what happens often is that people uh, decide upon a tool and it has zero adaption because nobody's motivated to use it. Mm -hmm. But if you let the passionate people, like this 10 to 20% in every company, mm -hmm. that really are super passionate and, and hardworking uh, about uh, solving the issues, if you let them like uh, work with everybody else on uh, the right tools to solve the problem, you will have adaption while choosing it even. Right, so even, right. even the PUC becomes very quickly Adopted. Uh, yeah. Adopted, yeah. Right, right. So just kind of to delve into the, the silo comment, um, I, I, I'm not sure. So when you say silo, though, what, yeah. what do you mean by that? Like what, what, what is in one of the silos or what causes those silos to uh, appear that you think are, are a good, the good type of silo? Or For example, my team is definitely a silo as well because mm -hmm. we are just responsible for our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There is uh, no end-to-end -end responsibility towards uh, the developer and his problems. Mm -hmm. So the developer um, sometimes even is an external company mm -hmm. and then you have internally a service owner, service okay. responsible guy, product owner, platform mm -hmm. owner, whatever. Yeah. So you have um, a limited number of people that own the thing and a completely different um, <coughs> department or even company that creates the thing. Mm -hmm. And we have users as well, so let's not forget about the users. So uh, there's a user um, department, mm -hmm. then there's a development department, then there's a service owner or business partner manager or whatever that, that yeah. might be. Yeah, yeah something like a product The, the process guy, yeah. 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 And, and there's the infrastructure, there's the, the people that run stuff, infrastructure or um, that run applications. And these are completely different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you can cut responsibilities through creating a um, set of contracts, like terms and conditions, mm -hmm. service level agreements and stuff. That is necessary from a legal point of view. We also do that. We have a clear responsibility border where we say this is nothing we are like this is our legally box. Yeah. responsible for. Okay. Yeah. But what we do is we um, have a culture beyond terms and conditions and mm -hmm. SLA. Mm -hmm. So we go um, to the other end, to the very other end of a non-existing end-to-end -end responsibility. Mm. We talk to the developers, we bypass sometimes the process guide because he trusts us. He's like, mm -hmm. why would I cause even like interfere friction with this between you guys? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Just, I trust you, I trust you, make the best out of it. Right. Um, and why should I cause friction here? Yep. By, by listening to the other guy, understanding something wrong and giving it completely right. wrong right. to the next guy. You've, you've just described yeah. why the entire role of developer advocacy exists. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, if you have uh, these friction walls that between user and developer, mm -hmm. between um, the orchestrator, which is the process guy, the product owner, uh, and the infrastructure department, you have a couple of friction walls that you can automate through. Mm -hmm. Just automate through it. Um, I mean, requirement engineering between users and product owner, that makes sense. Uh, that's a different, different uh, um, path. But from developer to process owner or finance uh, guy mm -hmm. uh, and infrastructure, that's two very, very strong friction walls in a, in a unilateral way um, often. And then uh, it arrives at infrastructure and we have to send it all the way back mm. uh, and say, no, we can't accept this because of this. You didn't meet the requirements of running something in a Kubernetes cluster. Your container has root. This is not allowed in our mm. infrastructure mm -hmm. and stuff like this, you know? And if we, if we just enable the people, the development teams in the first place, if we mm -hmm. just really take their hand and show them everything they need to know to work with our platform, with Kubernetes itself, with cloud native, with a vertical of uh, cloud provider native services, mm -hmm. like um, here's your AWS account, for example, or here's your Azure account, you can connect that, your own account and that service, like an RDS with your container. Mm -hmm. I don't need to provide that. Um, 
uh, I won't, as a platform team, I won't provide it better than Amazon does it itself. Right. Why should I resell that service like internally? So just get it directly from there, connect your uh, database. Well, yeah, that's a red light. <laughs> yeah, uh, this guy didn't agree with me. That's why I was kind of like, uh, yeah. yeah, um, hello. So, um, the having having these uh, these verticals um, of cloud native services mm -hmm. uh, that you can connect to um, your container, and having the infrastructure um, really just focusing on something that everybody needs. Mm -hmm. The common denominator in infrastructure security and runtime, that's it, period. Mm. Everything else kind of qualifies as special needs that not everybody has, like the 100%. Right. It, you have many 80-20 use cases there, but it's not the 100%. 100% is security and runtime. Mm. And uh, that said, uh, you have a, a set of um, uh, projects um, that if you enable them enough in using uh, the cloud native technologies, they can help themselves, first of all, which reduces support uh, tremendously, like day two support. Yeah. And um, they don't write 10 tickets each day because they have a question. They know how to run the stuff in the field. So, right. the first enablement or the enablement in general to be on the platform, the educational layer is our utmost um, focus when onboarding people. Mm -hmm. They need to learn using these technologies very well to work with us, to be on our platform. And then um, we help them automate that stuff. Right. Once okay. once it's automated, they just automate through the silos. Right. You okay. get all the DevSecOps benefits, yep. all the business value out of it. Um, and you respect the silos. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so, but you, your, t you or your team, right? Um, you know, goes kind of out and directly works with the, you know, kind of individual development team yeah. for like their first project. Kind of is that exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. And their second project, they're already semi-professional on it. Yeah, so yeah. They need so the support's just, way less. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes just an hour, and they're done. They right. they deploy to <laughs> pre-life, and in the same week they yeah. deploy to prod. And so the the applications though that are you're talking about are they mostly the net new ones, or are they um, you know yeah. migrations or like rebuilds or rewrites or um, yeah. or is it uh, because you said you don't yeah. do a lot of lift and shift. Yeah, um, uh, lift and shift where it makes sense, uh, we can talk about it, but it's not possible without a rewrite. So just lifting and shifting is is, is a myth, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah it, it's a very small kind of uh, set of projects. I think that lift and shift is yeah. probably a good idea if you're going to cloud native, because you really should. It's really if you if you re, the only way you can really take advantage of that new architectural environment is by re-architecting it. And it's not just exactly. like, you know, you're not just kind of rewriting code, you're actually improving the capability of the system, which, you know, that's often not something that is necessarily obvious with the kind of lift and shift scenario. But, Asking why, why would you lift and shift something yeah. if you're not improving it? Right. If you well, that, don't need auto scaling, for example. Or right. Right. Well, the uh, the one kind of scenario where it's kind of like you know I like the um, the lift and shift model, which is really like we're just taking this this old golden image VM and now we're managing it in Kubernetes through like Kubernetes or whatever. Um, and it's like that kind of level of lift and shift I think makes a lot of sense because yeah. you can kind of get to that single pane of glass stuff, you know, and all that jazz. Um, but you're not actually changing much about the application itself, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and then you wait for the next like logical round for when you would do the, you know, re-architecture or whatever. Um, you know, if you ever need to, or maybe you just end of life that particular piece of software. Who yeah, knows? Yeah. That might happen as well. Yeah. But yeah, to answer the question, like precisely, it's um, it's new stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like always. I would even say 100%. I mm. haven't seen any lift and shift scenario. Okay. Yeah, yeah there, there's one. Okay, let's say 90, 95%. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and but I think that also gives you an advantage in your um, how you're working with those teams, right? Because yeah, those teams exactly. are expecting to be building new and yeah. therefore learning new, um, and they're probably really excited about building new. Um, and so I think that also helps your kind of adoption connection yes. too, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, when it comes to uh, the different uh, business domains of an enterprise, uh, like an OEM, uh, you have shop floor systems, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of uh, legacy systems. Um, there's some modernization going on in all the places. So it's not only about um, software, uh, creating software, creating digital services. Sometimes it's also about um, migrating an entire factory mm -hmm. to a new system and uh, managing IoT devices. So the use cases are very, very diverse. And in this kind of field, we're more in a, in a consulting role. We don't do these kind of platforms ourselves. We don't mm -hmm. manage them ourselves. We focus really on the multi -cloud, multi uh, public cloud multi-tenancy use mm -hmm. case. Uh, with our own platform, but as a competence center, we consult other platforms in their um, emerging state or in their planning phase. We are supporting enterprise architecture management. Mm -hmm. We are supporting um, portfolio management, like everything an enterprise needs in terms of know-how about infrastructure and Kubernetes and cloud native technologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I was gonna kind of ask you, I wanted to do a quick shout out for the car though. Like, I am so impressed with the sight lines on this car because, uh, yeah. you know, it's like when I'm trying to take a, there's one of these turns that I take where there's basically a bike lane right next to me. And like, I can actually see in the mirror yeah. clearly where their bikes are. And I, you know, I just- The, the design is is uh, amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's really, it's really nice. Um, so, sorry, but I was gonna ask you, um, the so do you uh, you know what is the magic for how do you know when uh, they belong in which of those environments um, is it is it a lot of talking is there a fact you have yeah. somewhere that tells you the answer because I'm sure there's a lot of people who would like that um, answer. Um, we've we've been trying to like make a matrix out of where you can go through and see where you might belong to mm -hmm. Um, but we found out this is um, this is not very good because people then uh, tell other people they know what they want, uh -huh. and we can't ask them the free whys. Oh, okay. Because yeah, yeah. often um, people really tell you very precisely what they want. Right. But they're completely uh, on the wrong path <laughs> right, by, right. by their by their order. So they're like ordering uh, peanut butter and they're allergic to it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So and that happens actually quite often um, because they're not very deep into these technologies. So what we're doing here is um, we talk to each and every project and uh, or platform initiative on their business goals. We really consult them in product management in mm -hmm. the first place. That's that's what I do. I pre-qualify them in their requirements before they even talk to engineers. Okay. Yeah, this is super important actually because um, we need to find out why they're doing stuff uh, in the first place. And then what happens most of the time, and I'm really honest here, is that I tell you, we already got that. Talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They, they, many initiatives exist because the company is so big and we didn't know we already have it. Right. Yep. And there needs to be that couple of guys that just um, know the people and just pinpoint you to it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I totally hear that. I the, the, um, you know the the client that already or the person who already knows the requirements and you know knows exactly the answer and then is completely on the wrong path you know like i've mentioned many times before i spent a long time in consulting yeah and getting you know getting the customer or whoever to stop giving you the solution and instead tell you the problem yeah is, exactly. uh, you know a huge part of the the conversation and exactly. often very difficult that's that's a nice turnaround to um the transformation people first isn't it yeah 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 it's uh interesting um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Sebastian, uh, and for the car, obviously. Um, thank you and, for uh, having me. We really, uh, you know, we really appreciate it, and I think it's been a lot of fun. So, yeah. do you like your nice little tour of Amsterdam? Nowhere near as exciting as when you when you drove over here. But. Um, but from a driving experience, um, it's just nice being in the car with the massage seats. <laughs> I switched it on. Did yeah, you see it? Yeah, I saw you. You saw yeah. that. The people, yeah. the people. I haven't the even the attempted console. to figure out the console. I was like, yeah. I was like focusing on, no, don't yeah. do this. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. Don't do this. <laughs> exactly. All right, yeah. well, uh, totally. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. And uh, Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah.